Once upon a time, in the ancient lands of Persia, there existed a mighty empire known as the Achaemenid dynasty, ruled by the great Cyrus the Great. His empire stretched from the rugged mountains of Greece all the way to the flowing waters of the Indus River. The inscription at Naksharustam, near the grand city of Persepolis, tells tales of Gadara, known to us as Gandhara, and Hindush, which we recognize as the land of the Hindus, nestled among the many provinces of the Persian Empire. As time passed, the grip of the Persians on the Indian territories loosened, allowing local kingdoms to emerge. Then, in 327 BCE, a legendary figure known as Alexander the Great swept across the Persian Empire, bringing with him a wave of change. His conquests led to the establishment of smaller political entities within the vast territories, and he famously clashed with the Indian monarch Porus near the banks of the Jhelum River. Yet, it was not an easy journey for Alexander and his Macedonian army. The writings of the Greek historian Plutarch vividly describe the challenges they faced, particularly when confronted with the formidable forces of Porus and the daunting prospect of crossing the mighty Ganges River. Despite their valor, the Macedonians found themselves weary and hesitant to venture further eastward. Eventually, Alexander's journey came to a halt at the Hyphasis River, where his army, exhausted and apprehensive, refused to march onward. Leaving behind a contingent of Greek forces in Tuxila, Alexander passed away in 323 BCE, leaving a void in his wake. In the aftermath of Alexander's demise, a new chapter unfolded as his generals vied for power. Seleucus, one of Alexander's successors, found himself thrust into the tumultuous politics of the time. He ventured into the lands of Persia, Media, and eventually Punjab in northern India and Pakistan, expanding his influence across the vast expanse of the ancient world. But even before the days of Alexander's conquests, there were whispers of the Greeks in the distant lands of India. References to the Greeks as Yavanis can be found in early Indian literature, hinting at a connection that predates Alexander's arrival. Scholars like Panini and Kachayana, ancient luminaries of Sanskrit grammar and scholarship, make mention of the Yavanis in their script, shedding light on the cultural exchanges that took place across vast distances and through the corridors of time. As Alexander's conquests unfolded, they ushered in what historians now term the Hellenistic period, beginning in 323 BCE with Alexander's passing in Babylon. In the preceding years, his relentless campaign had brought the vast Persian Empire to its knees, stretching from Asia Minor to the edges of Central Asia and encompassing lands as diverse as Egypt and Mesopotamia. One of Alexander's foremost challenges was maintaining a connection with the Greek world while venturing ever deeper into the East. To address this, he devised a novel strategy, the establishment of military colonies and cities strategically positioned along his route. These settlements not only safeguarded vital supply lines, but also served as bastions of Greek influence in distant lands. Plutarch eloquently captured the significance of Alexander's endeavors, noting how he founded over 70 cities among diverse peoples, fundamentally altering their way of life. The aftermath of Alexander's conquests saw a massive influx of Greek immigrants into the East, encouraged by his successors who continued his policy of colonization. Over 75 years, around 250 new Hellenistic colonies sprung up, reshaping the cultural landscape of the region. A. Kanum, a recently discovered Hellenistic city nestled between Russia and Afghanistan, serves as a striking example of this cultural fusion. While predominantly Greek in its layout and institutions, it also bore traces of indigenous influences, reflecting the mutual exchange between Greeks and natives. Clearchus's inscription, a philosophical treatise carved in stone, epitomizes this exchange, offering the local populace a glimpse into Greek culture. The legacy of Alexander's settlements reverberated for centuries, shaping a new Hellenistic culture that stretched as far east as India. Though Greek culture did not wholly subsume the east, it provided a vital link between east and west, fostering a shared cultural identity that endured for centuries. This bond proved invaluable to Rome as it sought to establish its own political hegemony, drawing inspiration from the rich tapestry of Hellenistic culture. And in Hellenistic world, cities stood as bustling hubs of culture and commerce, teeming with life and opportunity. Much like modern metropolises, they boasted theaters, temples, and libraries, serving as seats of learning and artistic expression. Yet, amidst this cultural richness, a sense of unified enterprise often remained elusive. The Seleucid and Ptolemaic dynasties, ruling vast territories from the Mediterranean to the borders of India, engaged in trade spanning distant lands such as Arabia and Sub-Saharan Africa. 
caravan routes, traversing rugged terrains and desolate deserts, facilitated the exchange of luxury goods that defined the era. From the northern routes leading to the Euphrates River to the southern paths through Arabia, a vast network emerged, connecting the Mediterranean to the far reaches of Asia. The backbone of this trade was the resilient camel, carrying precious cargo of gold, silver, spices and silk. These luxury items, once mere indulgences, became essential commodities in the burgeoning prosperity of the Hellenistic world. In return, the Greeks and Macedonians exported their own goods, including metal weapons, cloth, wine, and olive oil, further enriching the tapestry of exchange. Amidst the swirl of commerce and culture, innovative years dawned on the borders of India with the emergence of the Indo-Greek Kingdom. Founded by Demetrius in 180 BCE, this realm blended Greek and Indian languages, symbols, and religious practices, leaving an indelible mark on history. Indo-Greek kings, spanning over two centuries, embraced a unique cultural syncretism, fostering a legacy that endures to this day through the diffusion of Greco-Buddhist art. Noteworthy among these interactions was the alliance between Chandragupta Maurya and Seleucus I, marked by diplomatic marriages and territorial concessions. This intermingling of Greek and Indian cultures laid the groundwork for unprecedented cooperation, epitomizing the spirit of cross-cultural exchange that defined the Hellenistic era. And Megasthenes, a Greek ethnographer of the Hellenistic period, holds a significant place in history as the author of Indica, serving as an ambassador to the court of Sandrokadis, likely Chandragupta Maurya, Megasthenes provided invaluable insights into the Indian subcontinent. Although the exact date of his embassy remains uncertain, scholars believe it occurred before 288 BCE, the year of Chandragupta's death. In his renowned work, Megasthenes delves into various aspects of Indian society, including its ancient mythology and geographical features. Notably, he mentions the worship of figures like Hercules, identified as Shiva, and Dionysus, interpreted as Krishna or Indra, shedding light on the religious practices prevalent at the time. Interestingly, his silence on Buddhism suggests that it had not yet gained widespread prominence, hinting at its later rise under the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka. Indica served as a crucial source for later historians such as Strabo and Arian, offering invaluable insights into the ancient world. Apollodorus, a Greek historian from the 1st century BCE, referenced Megasthenes' account to highlight the conquests of the Bactrian Greeks in India, underscoring the far-reaching impact of Hellenistic influence. One landmark in the interaction between Greek and Indian civilizations was the advent of coinage. While the origins of coinage remain elusive, evidence suggests that it emerged independently in Asia Minor, India and China during the 6th century BCE. The Greeks, particularly those in Lydia and Ionia, minted the first coins from Electrum, a natural alloy of gold and silver, around 650 BCE. Indian coinage also has ancient roots, with archaeological finds dating back to the 5th and 6th centuries BCE. Coins discovered in sites like Chaman Hazuri and Bur, Tuxila, provide tangible evidence of early Indian coinage, predating the arrival of the Greeks in India. Panini's Ashtadhyayi, composed in the 4th or 5th century BCE, mentions various coins used in financial transactions, indicating their familiarity in ancient Indian society. The introduction of Greek coins in India, notably those of Menander and Apollodotus I, marked a significant cultural exchange. These bilingual coins, inscribed in Greek and Pali, reflected a remarkable concession to local culture. The adoption of the Karasti script on coins further exemplified the collaborative nature of coin minting in the Hellenistic world. The influence of Greek coinage extended beyond its introduction, shaping the coinage practices of subsequent Indian dynasties. From the Kunindas in Punjab to the Kushans in Central Asia, the use of Greek language and imagery persisted for centuries, leaving an indelible mark on the numismatic history of the region. And, the story of Menander, a prominent Indo-Greek king, unfolds as one of conquest and cultural exchange. Regarded as one of the most successful rulers of his time, Menander's legacy is epitomized by the widespread dissemination of his coins, which bear witness to his expansive realm. His influence extended so far that the Menander Mons, or Mountains of Menander, became synonymous with the easternmost reaches of the Indian subcontinent. Menander's significance transcends mere political conquests. He is also remembered in Buddhist literature as a convert to Buddhism. Embracing the teachings of the Buddha, Menander became an arhat, revered for his spiritual enlightenment. His introduction of a new coin type, featuring Athena Alkidimos on the reverse, 
underscores his commitment to cultural fusion, a sentiment echoed by his successors in the East. The advent of Buddhism marks a pivotal moment in the evolution of art, culture, and religion in India. Originating from the teachings of the Buddha, Buddhism gained widespread acceptance following his passing, with his disciples elevating him to near-divine status. Stupas and symbols associated with the Buddha, such as the Bodhi tree, became objects of veneration, serving as focal points for worship and commemoration. The emergence of Gandhara art represents a pinnacle of artistic expression within the Buddhist world. Situated in the lower Kabul Valley and upper Indus regions, Gandhara schools of art flourished under the patronage of Kushan kings. Although the exact origins of the Buddha image remain debated, Gandhara stands as a testament to the exquisite craftsmanship and devotion of Buddhist practitioners. During the Kushan period, Gandhara reached its zenith, particularly under the reign of King Kanishka. As a devoted patron of Buddhism, Kanishka oversaw the expansion of the faith, ushering in an era of artistic innovation and religious fervor. Gandhara became a beacon of Buddhist pilgrimage, attracting devotees from far and wide to witness its monumental sculptures and sacred sites. Under Kanishka's rule, Mahayana Buddhism flourished, and representations of the Buddha in human form proliferated. Monasteries and stupas adorned the landscape, serving as centers of spiritual contemplation and artistic expression. Kanishka's towering legacy endured through the ages, immortalized in the monumental structures he erected, though eventually succumbing to the ravages of time and conquest. And, the exploration of Gandhara's ancient ruins began in the 19th century, driven by the curiosity of British soldiers and administrators. The discovery of coins from the post-Ashoka era, coupled with translated Chinese travelogues, provided crucial insights into the region's history. Figures like Charles Masson, James Princep, and Alexander Cunningham played pivotal roles in deciphering the Karasti script and identifying significant sites such as Tuxila. John Marshall's extensive excavation of Tuxila from 1912 to 1934 further illuminated the region's past, revealing separate Greek, Parthian, and Kushan cities alongside numerous stupas and monasteries. Kanishka, a prominent Kushan king, left an enduring legacy through his coinage, which transitioned from Greek to Bactrian legends and depicted Iranian divinities. Among his rare Buddhist coins, some featured a standing Buddha in Hellenistic style, bearing Greek inscriptions. The portrayal of the Buddha in this manner, reminiscent of a king, may have been influenced by the Greco-Bactrian king Demetrius I, who himself may have served as a prototype for the Buddha image. Gandharan art, characterized by its blend of Greek and Buddhist elements, showcased unique representations of Greek deities alongside Buddhist figures. Notably, Heracles, depicted in the same manner as on Demetrius' coins, served as a protector deity in Greco-Buddhist art. This fusion extended to architectural designs, incorporating Greek motifs such as Corinthian pillars into Buddhist structures. In Matara, another center of Buddhist art, sculptures exhibited distinctive features, reflecting local artistic traditions. Unlike Gandharan art, Mathuran images of the Buddha displayed indigenous characteristics, with influences from older Indian male fertility gods. The evolution of Buddhist iconography in Madara paralleled developments in Gandhara, albeit with distinct stylistic elements. Furthermore, the cultural exchange between Greeks and Indians extended beyond art to language. Sanskrit adopted several Greek words related to writing and warfare, illustrating the cross-cultural interaction during the Greek rule. Additionally, individuals like Friotes, the Indo-Parthian king of Tuxila, received Greek education and spoke the language fluently, highlighting the influence of Greek culture in the region. The use of the Greek script persisted in official documents and inscriptions until the period of Islamic invasions in the 7th-8th century CE, underscoring the enduring legacy of Greek influence in Gandhara and beyond. And, one area of notable influence is astronomy and astrology. Vedanga Jatisha, compiled by Lagada around 135 BCE, stands as one of the earliest Indian texts on these subjects. It provides advanced astronomical knowledge and rules for horoscopic astrology, laying the groundwork for the Vedanga discipline of Jatisha. The Yavana Hataka, translated from Greek to Sanskrit in 149 to 150 CE, reflects astrological techniques developed in the Hellenistic world and contains instructions for calculating astrological charts based on one's birth time and place. The influence of Greek astronomy and mathematical methods is evident in these texts, showcasing a blend of Indian and Greek knowledge systems. The Indo-Greek interaction also left its mark on Indian thought and religion. 
Scholars believe that Mahayana Buddhism, a distinct movement that emerged around the first century BCE in the northwestern Indian subcontinent, coincided with the Indo-Greek flourishing. Mahayana Buddhism emphasizes seeking complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, and its early references date back to texts like the Lotus Sutra. This tradition likely received influences from various sources along the Silk Road, including popular Hindu devotional cults, Persian and Greco-Roman theologies. The emergence of Mahayana Buddhism has been linked to the convergence of Greek philosophical schools with rudimentary elements already present in early Buddhism. Although the origins of key Mahayana tenets like the Bodhisattva ideal cannot be solely attributed to Greek roots. Overall, the Indo-Greek cultural exchange catalyzed significant developments in astronomy, astrology, and religious thought, fostering a rich tapestry of ideas that continue to shape the cultural heritage of the Indian subcontinent.